Happy Tuesday. It's time for Coffee and Cursey Words. I can't believe what we're covering today because I did not see this coming. I got off a plane at like 11 o'clock something something last night. It was a very long travel day. It's been a very long few days, but we're here and we have a stacked and packed um, Tuesday Coffee and Cursey Words for you. My computer is not pulling up my other screen for me, and I am not having a good time with that right now. Oh, technology, you're my friend. So with that, oh my God, why is this not working? That's gonna be a problem. Good times, everybody, good times, good times. I can't even um, access my stream right now. Oh, there we go, all right. Emily, were you going to cancel Coffee and Cursey Words today? Yes, I was going to bump it a few days because I am just travel tired. But then Jen Shaw pled guilty and then Johnny Depp's team responded to this Juror 15 madness in a way that is so wild and wild that I'm like, we can't wait. We just can't wait another day. So let me know where you're coming in from. I have all of the water that I can muster today. And Dr. B is helping me make coffee. Why? Because I didn't have a chance to do it yet because I was busy pulling all the documents for the live stream because I bought Wi-Fi on the flight last night and the Wi-Fi on the flight didn't work. And I'm pissed because that was my prep time and I had to sleep. So with that, I'm gonna figure out what's going on with my computer. We're gonna roll the intro replay crew. Love you the most. Um, just, there will be timestamps when we're done. It's so good to see everybody coming in. Let's get this, let's get this show going. We have so much to cover. So I'm gonna roll the intro and we're gonna we're gonna do it. Hey there. If we haven't met yet, I'm Emily D. Baker, the badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator. I'm the host of the Emily Show, and I break down the legal shit behind the news and pop culture stories we all want to talk about. I have been a licensed attorney for over 15 years, but this is not legal advice. I should warn you, I'm a big fan of the cursey words. This channel is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not fuckery. I love seeing you guys come in, not just from all over the world, because you are from all over the world, and it's so good to see you in all the different time zones, but it's also so much fun to see local people. You know, I'm seeing like Long Beach, California. I'm like, oh, Long Beach. I loved working in Long Beach. Working in Long Beach was one of my favorite assignments as a DA because I just, I love Long Beach. We used to go on field trips down to the Aquarium of the Pacific with my kids in school, and it was so fun because then I could take them up to see the courthouse where I worked after we like field tripped before I took them home. Like just, just good memories. Um, Emily, do you miss living in California? No. Could you ever live in New York where I was this weekend? Also, no. No, I don't. I no. Uh, do I enjoy a good city once in a while? Yes. Is it for me long term? No. No. I love being city adjacent where I can like get there if I need to, but not be there all the time. So that I was in New York. Part of what I was doing in New York was getting ready for Jen Shaw's trial on Monday. Guess what? We've got a whole podcast about it tomorrow that I need to record an addendum to because I did not think in a million motherfucking years that Jen Shaw was going to plead guilty. That is the first thing we're covering today. It was a factual basis plea. There is so much information here. We're going to go through all of it. So no quick bits today. I know, I know, but we don't, we literally don't have time. <laughs> we literally don't have time for quick bits today. And I'm like, oh, damn it. But here's the thing. I never thought Jen Shaw would play. On the show, Jen Shaw is like, I am gonna prove all of you wrong. I am innocent, innocent, innocent. It's innocent till proven guilty. And then was selling merch selling merch, hashtag justice for Jen Shaw and stuff like that. So Jen had her friends around her for their last pretrial conference. Their last pretrial conference went and confirmed that they were going to trial on July 18th, next Monday. Her attorney had been pushing the court and the government to go to trial. We've been waiting for trial. We've been wanting to do this, blah, 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 blah. 
And then, a mere week before trial, Jen Shaw blinked and pled guilty. If you're not familiar with Jen Shaw, she is a real housewife of Salt Lake City. This is a very short quick bit because I have a case brief on it tomorrow that I, yep, that's happening either way. Jen Shaw's a real housewife of Salt Lake City. It's only two seasons old, but they, I know they have been filming season three. I think they're probably going to pick up cameras right now for season four if they're not already filming um, for, you know, Jen Shaw, whatever's going to happen next. So Real Housewife of Salt Lake City, it's a fairly new franchise. She was one of the most polarizing figures in that uh, franchise. In the middle of filming season two of Real Housewife of Salt Lake City, Jen Shaw gets indicted by the feds out of the Southern District of New York. SDNY does not play. The feds in general do not play. The Southern District of New York has a reputation for going after large kind of white collar crime cases, among other things. They love a good ring of people. They're like, what's one defendant when you can have 40? Let's go. So, um... They go after her and her first assistant, Stuart Smith, in a superseding indictment that adds them to a case that has 10 other defendants already in in process. Two counts in the indictment, conspiracy to commit wire fraud, conspiracy to commit money laundering. The government alleges that Jen Shaw is like the tip of the spear of this case. Jen Shaw it, there's a filing by the government showing that Jen Shaw is not just a tier one defendant, but she's at the top, top. She's tier A. She's like the most culpable of the most culpable. In tomorrow's podcast, I go through the sentencing. Some of the individuals have gotten, most of them have ha- actually, should we pull this up now? Yes. Let's just pull it up now to answer the question that's rumbling around my brain uh, real quick. Because Jen Shaw is now pled Let's see. But all of the other defendants in this case have already pled. I just have to remember which of the three research documents I put this in. All of the other defendants have pled. Some of them have been sentenced. Some of them have not. One of them forfeited $1.4 million with $3.5 million in restitution. One of them forfeited $100,000 with $1.5 million in restitution. One of them forfeited $650,000 with $3.5 million in restitution. This is a lot of money that other defendants have already forfeited and are paying as restitution. Everyone has pled guilty now. We're going to talk about Jen Shaw's restitution. We're going to talk about the difference between forfeited and restitution. We're going to talk about when she will be sentenced, when Stuart Smith will be sentenced, because his sentencing was put off until after this trial. Stuart Smith, her first assistant. Can we do them on the same day? It would be so great if we could just do them on the same day. It would be so great. Um, I Since I was going to be in New York for trial, I'm considering going to New York for sentencing. I want to see who comes and talks, truly. I was shocked that she, I'm still shocked that she pled. Here's what I think about this. And we're going to go through the plea and all of the paperwork in just a second. But here are my thoughts first. Ow, my coffee's so hot. I normally drink iced coffee. And then, and then today I'm like, oh no, we're, we're not drinking iced coffee today. We're drinking hot coffee. And with the hot coffee comes the hot coffee, hot pockets. So with that, um, we've got this static thing. Apologies. It should be back. So with, let's see, I'm pulling up the, um, all the sentencing information. Her sentencing date is set for November and we'll get into that in a minute, but they put her, um, first assistance sentencing over so that he could testify against her in this trial. And it'll be interesting to see what his sentence is when he's sentenced. He alleges, well, it seems that he is was going to allege that Jen induced him to lie in depositions with the FTC. So there's still stuff coming for this case with the sentencing. There's still information to come. 
Let's look at what this plea deal means. Oh, I was going to tell you why I thought she pled. Jen Shaw has been appearing in this case virtually, or her attorneys have been appearing. She's been appearing via Zoom. Um, she has not walked into this courtroom until last week. I think that that made it real. Like shit didn't get real for Jen Shaw until last week. When you walk into a federal courtroom and you see where the jury's going to sit and you see the judge and you see the prosecution dead in the face and you're like, oh, I don't know what the judge said. Often judges will have um, a little bit of a something, something to say, like, you know, you're facing this much time. You know that everyone else is, but like these sorts of conversations generally will happen in front of a defendant before trial. Jen Shaw was facing by my calculations on the indictment of the two counts plus the allegation up to 60 years, between 55 and 60 years with that enhancement of the allegation. That's a long time in federal prison. She's also facing a substantial amount of restitution, which we now know because she changed her plea. This popped up onto the docket really quick, but based on the date of the documents, we know that the government and Jen Shaw's attorneys were talking about this. Jen Shaw being in New York facilitated these conversations, I'm sure, but I think this became really, really real for her when she walked into that courtroom and smelled it and saw it and and had to have that real conversation of, you are up against the federal government. This is their third round of prosecution on this money laundering scheme and this um, this telemarketing scheme. Third round. There have been three groups of trials. Three. Three groups of trials on this case. Upwards of 10 defendants each. Most have pled. Some have gone to trial. The government has won every single one. There had to be a conversation about that. There had to be an ongoing conversations about that because the chances of winning this case for Jen Shaw, based on everything I've read in this case, were very, very, very low. To be fair, going up against the federal government is often a losing gambit for criminal defendants. The feds do not fuck around. And the feds don't take a lot of cases. The feds don't like to lose. I think the feds kind of, you know, wiggle out of cases that might be more challenging, that might mess up their winning streak and throw them over to local prosecutors. And they're like, oh, we're not going to take this. You can take it. They get to cherry pick their cases and they have the money, the time and the resources to do it. So they don't take stuff that's like, you know, we have this evidence it needs to go to trial. They take stuff that they're like, we are going to bury you underneath the federal prison because we have that much evidence. And in cases like this, documentary evidence. But it is a financial crime. She is not going to get the maximum on this. You don't in financial crimes. The money and the restitution tends to be a big part of it. She has now pled. She is going to federal prison. Her sentencing date is at the end of November, like right after Thanksgiving. So let's see, sentencing submissions are due um, in early November, and then the sentencing date's set for November 28th. However, Jen Shaw is a mom, and they might give her time after she's sentenced to turn herself in. It's not uncommon. She's been out of custody this long. So even if they sentence her November 28th, they might still give her time before she actually has to turn herself in. So what that means for Bravo is they could still get an entire season four out of this if they're not already filming it, because I know they've filmed season three. They could have cameras rolling between now and December or now and November and, and still pick up everything down to her being sentenced and then do a final interview with her before she turns herself into custody. There's still... There's still a lot of time. She's got a lot of stuff she's going to have to deal with because she is going to be in prison for, um, well, the highest sentencing I've seen on any of the co-defendants in this particular case is over seven years. And they say that she's more culpable than that. 
So is it reasonable to think we're looking at upwards of seven years? Yes, it is. Um, Susie is asking about celebrity privilege. No, um, that's in financial crimes. It's pretty common that after sentencing, if asked and if people have not violated their terms of release, that they are given time to turn themselves in. It happened in all of the college admission cases, especially when there's a plea. When you're sentenced after trial, it's not necessarily the same, but there is a there is a lot of options here for um for her to be out for a little bit longer before she turns herself in. I actually think that in a lot of cases, celebrities are made an example of more. Kathy O'Toole, why does sentencing take so long? There's a lot of paperwork to be done. There's evaluations and interviews and all that stuff. Um, Sherry, that's not accurate. She did not get 14 years. So I'm going to go through the documents today and we're going to talk about that, but that's not exactly precisely accurate. So let's go. Let's go. We're going to talk through all of the documents on Jen Shaw's plea, because of course we are. I wanted to give you my thoughts on it first before we just crack into reading documents, because my brain needs time to catch up from sleep. I got new earrings, though. That was one of my one of my very exciting things. We got new earrings. We got new earrings. And this side, we got new earrings over here. I'm very, very excited about the new earrings. All right. Let us talk about the change of play. So all of this, yesterday I was phone off unavailable. So imagine when I turned my phone on, the amount of text messages about this plea. I was not expecting her to be in court. It pops up on the docket super quick. Fred, for FFS, Fred. Uh, darling, that's loud. Uh, thank you. Over here, please. Thank you, darling. Um, we've got a, a code, Fred. Let's see. So this popped up on the docket. And by the docket, I mean the actual docket that there was going to be a change of plea. And it was literally a, um, this was yesterday that popped up right as it was happening. Order as to Jen Shaw, it's ordered that a change of plea hearing will take place July 11th at 10 30 AM. There was no way that they weren't talking about this over the weekend. So they were absolutely having this conversation over the weekend and we'll see that in other documents in just a moment. So as we get to the change of plea here, it's hereby ordered that a change of plea hearing will take place July 11th, 2022, 10 30 AM in the courtroom where this was assigned for trial. Of course. So let's get into what all of that looks like. There are, I'm going to go through the forfeiture. Well, let's just go through the plea and then the forfeiture and then the statements by the parties. That's what we're doing. Plea, forfeiture, statements by the parties. Getting distracted by Fred. No, that one goes up here. Getting distracted by Fred. Plea, forfeiture, and we'll talk about what all that means together because the forfeiture is different. I see all the super chats. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to get to them as we break between topics. But you guys, I appreciate it. I appreciate, I appreciate it. Is Rob in the chat? Hello, Rob. You had to show up. It was a stacked, <laughs> the deck was stacked against her. Anytime you're up against the feds, anytime you're up against the feds. Uh, the, these cats right now, these cats right now, they are not messing around. They're like, we'll talk about stacks too. All right. So July 10th by email from the U S department of justice, um, wasn't July 10th, like Sunday. So this was all going down over the weekend. I'm not surprised. Dear counsel, uh, United States versus Jennifer Shaw. This is from the prosecutions to Jen's attorneys. On the understanding specified below the office of the U S attorney for the Southern district of New York will accept a guilty plea from defendant Jennifer Shaw. What's really interesting about this is she had not been offered a guilty plea earlier. They talked about it in other court hearings that she had not been offered a plea. Here's why I think she wasn't offered a plea. She said, I'm going to trial. I'm innocent. And they're like, okay, go ahead. So you're not going to offer someone a plea that's like, I'm not plea. Fine, don't plea. Because then you end up negotiating against yourself. If you want to talk about a deal, you can come to us and tell us that you're interested and then we will work out a deal. 
But they're not just going to be like, the deal is this. The plea will be to one count in the above referenced indictment. That's the um, the wire fraud count. We talked about the wire fraud count on Tuesday and Friday. Wire fraud's very broad. It covers all manner of things done through the wires. So all the online stuff and the telemarketing stuff that's being alleged here and now she's convicted of, that all counts under wire fraud. The wire fraud carries a maximum term of 30 years and a maximum term of supervised release of five years. That means if you get out, you can be on supervised release for five years with terms and conditions. Like, you know, you cannot participate in telemarketing. You cannot participate in lead generation. All these things. That's the supervised release. A max, uh, maximum fine of the greatest of $250,000 or twice the gross pecuniary gain derived from the offense or twice the gross pecuniary loss to persons other than the defendant resulting from the offense. That's important to know. In consideration for the defendant's plea in the above case, the defendant will not be further prosecuted by this office. Note, except for criminal tax violations, if any, as to which this office cannot and does not make any agreement. Ooh, bitch. Whenever you have a fraud case, you have to consider that the monies derived from the fraud are not exactly reported on your taxes. But if you're deriving that money and moving that money around, it is a very real consideration that there are tax implications and consequences. And tell me, chat, what do we know about the IRS? They petty and they get their money. They petty and they get their money. So there could be tax consequences here. The IRS will take you down, even if no one else will. And the IRS investigators are like accountants, but they get guns. Like if you're going to be an accountant, you get to be like an accountant, but also law enforcement. Wild. Um, so will not be further prosecuted for participating in a conspiracy to commit wire fraud in connection with the conduct of telemarketing. So if more comes out, she will not be further prosecuted for it. It being understood that this agreement does not bar the use of such conduct, does not bar the use of such conduct as a predicate act or the basis for a sentencing enhancement in a subsequent prosecution included, but not limited to, a prosecution pursuant to Section 1961. What do they mean by that? RICO stuff. So if there is another criminal organization, this can be a predicate act, an underlying act, and things like that. The defendant agrees with respect to any and all dismissed charges that she is not a prevailing party. You didn't win! It was dismissed. You did not win. You did not prevail. You settled. Settling is not winning. The defendant admits the forfeiture allegation with respect to count one. What's forfeiture mean? The government takes your shit. We're going to go through forfeiture more. The government comes and takes your stuff. And if they can't get the money, they can take other stuff that you bought with the money or that they can prove that you bought with the money. And if they can't prove where all her money came from, They're going to be like, thank you, thank you, thank you. The agrees to forfeit a sum of money equal to $6.5 million. She's agreeing to forfeit $6.5 million. That's the forfeiture. The government takes your stuff. In currency, representing proceeds traceable to the commission of the offense. It's further understood that any forfeiture of the defendant's assets, your property, shall not be treated as satisfaction of any fine, restitution, cost of imprisonment, or any other penalty the court may impose on her in addition to forfeiture. If we take your stuff, it's only to go to the $6.5 million in forfeiture. But wait, there's more. 
But wait, there's more. The defendant further agrees to make restitution in the amount of $9.5 million. Restitution. Restitution goes to the victims. How many, how much money, how much money was taken in this scheme that we have this defendant getting $9.5 million in restitution, but we have other defendants getting $3.5 million in restitution, $1.5 million in restitution, another $3.5 million in restitution. How much money? That's what, three, six, five, so that's seven, eight, Point five plus the nine point five, like uh, what? We're like getting close to twenty million in restitution from just this handful of defendants. They're not all even sentenced yet. How much money? How much money? Cheryl asked the important question: What was she selling? Business opportunities for online businesses to people over fifty-five. We're going to get into that in her factual basis plea don't you worry we're going to get into that a little bit more how much money how much money how much money to have restitution that high and a forfeiture of 6.5 million dollars there's a lot of fucking money missing my coffee's closed you can't drink it that way emily you got you got to open the hole first the coffee hole into the mouth hole all right they go through the offense level which gets into the federal sentencing guidelines. As of November 1st, 2021, the guideline for count one is 2B1. I'm not going to go through the base levels and stuff. This is getting deeply nerdy into the federal sentencing. This plea deal is available on Twitter. I will show you where when we get into the coverage from the hearing. But they say with the above, the guidelines offense levels 33, the criminal history, zero criminal history, sentencing range. Based upon the calculations set forth above, the defendant's stipulated guidelines. Remember, the statutory maximum is over 30 years because there's also an enhancement. The stipulated guidelines, they're agreeing what a guideline is, is between 135 to 168 months imprisonment. That is the stipulated guideline. They're agreeing that that is the range that is appropriate under the federal sentencing guidelines. The range. The range is not binding on the judge. The judge has up to 30. This is a guideline. In addition, after determining the defendant's ability to pay, the court may impose a fine pursuant to the code between 35,000 and 350,000. So it could be 350,000 in fines, which I think she'll get on the higher end of fines because with the higher end of fines, um, she took this case all the way to the end. She might get the higher end of fines. So 350 in fines plus 6.5 in forfeiture, taking your shit, plus 9.5 in restitution. So they're agreeing that the guideline is between 11.25 and 14 years. She could get more or less than that, but that's the guideline. That's not how much she's getting. Let me be very clear. The judge gets to decide. But the parties are agreeing what they're asking the judge for. They're going to ask the judge for between 135 and 168, and they agree that neither a downward nor upward departure is warranted. Your Honor, we agree. In this range between 11 and 14. The highest sentencing in this group of prosecutions so far has been over seven, just over seven. Accordingly, neither party will seek any departure or adjustment pursuant to the guidelines not set forth herein. We're not even going to argue to the judge to do more. The parties agree that either party may seek a sentence outside of the stipulated guidelines based on factors to be considered in imposing the sentence. So... They're not going to seek to adjust the guidelines, but they can argue for a sentence outside the guidelines. The defense can say the guideline is this, but we'd like it to be lower. And the prosecution can say the guideline is this, but we'd like it to be higher. The judge gets to decide. Except as provided in any written proffer agreements that may have been entered into between this office and defendants, nothing in this agreement limits the rights of parties to present to the probation officer the court facts relevant to sentencing 
make any arguments with regard to the stipulated guidelines range or where in the range they should fall. Seek an appropriately adjusted guidelines range if it's determined based on new information that they can, et cetera. So they're allowed to bring up information, but they agree what the guideline is, which takes a lot of argument out. Here's the important part. It is understood that the sentence to be imposed upon the defendant is determined solely by the court. The judge can go from zero to 30. They're agreeing to the guideline, but the judge can pick picky choosy anything in that range. That's what's important with federal sentencing. It's so different. They agree to plea. They agree to dismiss a count. They agree to what the sentencing is, but it's in the hands of the judge at the end of the day, not the government. Danny said, so she could still face up to 30 years. Yes. The stipulated guideline is them saying to the court, this is what the guideline is that's appropriate. But it also says they're allowed to argue up or down. They're not allowed to depart the guidelines, but they're allowed to argue up or down. The judge gets to decide. I think people keep missing that. The judge gets to decide. The judge gets to decide. I'm just going to make my face bigger. It's happening. I will show you where this is if you want to download it for yourself. It is further understood that the guidelines are not binding on the court. Mm. We agree to all the shit above, but the court gets to decide and the guidelines aren't binding on the court. The defendant acknowledges that her entry of a guilty plea to the charge of offense authorizes the sentencing court to impose any sentence up to and including the statutory maximum sentence. Oh, we're agreeing on the range, but the judge can still sentence you to up to 30. It is in writing. This office cannot and does not make any promises or representations as to what sentence the defendant will receive. This is why people get confused on plea agreements. There's a plea agreement, but the plea agreement is we agree to not argue that the departure should be higher, but the judge can still do what the fuck ever. Moreover, it's understood that the defendant will have no right to withdraw her plea of guilty should the sentence imposed by the court be outside the guidelines set forth above. We sentence you to 30. You can't say, I, I'm not doing that. You're in it now. You pled. You're in it now. Literally at the mercy of the court. Oh, 30 is never going to happen. Okay. I completely agree. 30 is never going to happen, but this isn't capped. I've seen people say she's getting 14. It's capped at 14. She can't get more than this. And that's just not true. She can get less than 11. She can get more than 14 and a half or whatever. She can get 15. She can get two. It's up to the judge. I don't think it'll be higher than the, I don't think it'll be higher than the range. I really don't. I really don't think it'll be higher than the range. The highest any defendant has gotten in this case is seven. So I think in that like seven to 11 range is probably appropriate um, at the very end of the range. This is, a, I don't think she's going to get anywhere near to 30, but she could. It's possible, unlikely, but possible. It's agreed that the defendant will not file a direct appeal or nor bring a collateral challenge, including but not limited to the challenges. The government will not appeal a sentence within or above the stipulated guidelines range. The provision binding on the parties, even if the court employs a guidelines analysis, different. Furthermore, it is agreed that any appeal as to the defendant's sentence is not foreclosed by this provision will be limited to the portion of the sentence calculated that is inconsistent with the above stipulation. She can't appeal if she's sentenced within the range that they've agreed to. The parties agree this waiver applies regardless of whether a term of imprisonment is opposed to run consecutively or concurrently with the discharge portion of any sentence of imprisonment that has been imposed, which there isn't any. Then they get through the money stuff. The defendant agrees not to appeal or bring challenge to the forfeiture amount, not to appeal the amounts. You have agreed you can't appeal. 
The defendant acknowledges that she accepted this agreement and decided to plead guilty because she is, in fact, guilty. By entering this plea of guilty, the defendant waives any and all right to withdraw her plea or to attack her conviction and sentence. The defendant recognizes that if she's not a citizen of the United States, these are all the waivers that you need to give. That's not an issue here. It's further agreed that should the conviction following the defendant's plea of guilty pursuant to the agreement be vacated for any reason, the prosecution is not time barred by the statute of limitations to come back and prosecute you again. Uh, apart from any proffer agreements, this is the understanding signed by all the parties involved, including Jen Shaw. She signed this on July 11th yesterday. This is the forfeiture agreement. Whereas on or about March 30th, 2021, Jen Shaw, I want to know how much they took out of her house when the cameras were rolling. Uh, whereas the indictment included forfeiture allegations, it did on or about July 11th, the defendant pledged she did a sum or property really amounting to 650,000. Great. Defendant is jointly and severably liable with her co-defendant Stuart Smith to the extent a forfeiture money judgment is entered against Stuart Smith. So together and separate. Defendant consents to the entry of the money judgment order. Mm, does it talk about any property they already have? I don't see it. This is where you send the money. Great. That's not the signed one. That's just an attachment. There is a signed one on the docket. Let's get to the statements real quick. Here's what we know about Jen Shaw's plea. Forfeiting $6.5 million in money or assets. Paying $9.5 million in restitution. She can be fined up to $350,000. They've agreed to a stipulated guidelines range between 11-ish and 14-ish years, but the judge can sentence her to whatever. She can't appeal a sentence within the agreed upon range. She'll be sentenced at the end of November. There will be sentencing memorandums. We will be looking at the sentencing memorandums. Let's look at the press release from the Southern District of New York. They don't even put her name in the headline. Look, if I'm Jen Shaw, I'm like, at least say my name. Like, I am more than just a reality show cast member. Uh, Celine, yes, they can go after joint assets. Anything she holds, they can go after. If it's traceable, and in a scheme like this, the government can make fetch happen with anything. Reality show cast member pleads guilty to running nationwide telemarketing fraud scheme. Damon Williams, the United States attorney for the Southern District of New York, announced earlier today Jen Shaw pled guilty to conspiracy to commit wire fraud in connection with telemarketing, saying, quote, Jen Shaw was a key participant in a nationwide scheme that targeted elderly, vulnerable victims. These victims were sold false promises of financial security, but instead Shaw and her co-conspirators defrauded them out of their savings and left them with nothing to show for it. This office is committed to rooting out these schemes, whatever form they take. According to the allegations in the indictment and statements made during the plea, we're going to get to what she said during the plea. Statements made during the plea from 2012 to March 2021, Shaw with others carried out a wide ranging telemarketing scheme that defrauded hundreds of victims throughout the United States, many of whom were over the age of 55 by selling those victims so called business services in connection with the victims purported online business, the business opportunity scheme. In order to perpetrate the business opportunity scheme, participants, including Shaw, engaged in a widespread coordinated effort to traffic in lists of potential victims or leads. Remember on the show when she said she did lead generation? That was true. She just didn't say what she was lead genning for. Many of whom had previously made an initial investment to create online businesses with other participants in the scheme. Shaw, among other things, sold leads to other participants by using their telemarketing sales floors with the knowledge that the individuals they had identified as leads would be defrauded by other participants, including by lying about how much they would earn after purchasing the business services and the purported success of others who had purchased the services. Shaw received as profit a share of the fraudulent revenue 
I said that weird, a share of the fraudulent revenue per the team's, uh, per the terms of their agreement with the participants. Shaw often controlled each aspect of the frauds perpetrated by the other participants on the individuals they had identified by. This is how Shaw controlled this. Determining which coaching sales floors could buy leads from her, selecting the downstream sales floors in which the coaching sales floors were permitted to pass leads. So directing where they were being sent to. So she collected the leads and sold the leads to the people who are making the fraudulent calls. Choosing the firms to provide the fulfillment services, another realm of this, that is documents and records purporting to demonstrate that the services the participants claimed to provide to those victims were actual and legitimate, setting how much the downstream floors could charge and determining which products each of the downstream sales floors could sell. In one of the other prosecutions, they talk about what was sold and they were selling people like, hey, if you pay us 15K, we'll set up this entire business for you. It'll be like your online store. It'll start gener generating revenue. And then when people are like, okay, but I I've paid you the 15K and nothing's filled. Oh, we'll pay us a little more and we're going to get you into this elite marketing coaching to help you. And we're going to redo your website with SEO. This is an example. And then when people were like, I can't do anymore, they're like, oh, we can, we can, we can help you with debt settlement. And so they would get passed along enough to get to the point where they're like, I have no money. And they're like, great, we'll just take the rest of what you have to do debt consolidation. The scheme that was listed out across these three prosecutions is high pressured sales using tactics of shame and embarrassment. And people fall into that sunk money fallacy well, shit, I've already put $15,000 into this. If I put in just a little bit more, I can fix it. If I put in just a little bit more, I can fix it. And if I put in a little bit more, I won't have to tell my family that I've lost this money and I can fix it and prayed on that shame. One of the things I learned very quickly in working with victims of fraud as a district attorney is that shame goes a huge way in allowing fraudsters to continue to defraud because when victims are ashamed, they do not tell anyone who could be like, wait, hold on, put on the brakes. And I saw it happen in law firms, in professional services offices to celebrities. Anyone can be a victim of fraud. The shame and embarrassment is what keeps people from getting out of it and letting eventually them use everything. The high pressured sales is part of what does this. And it happens to so many people. The way I yelled when my dad was like, no, somebody said I had a virus on my computer and I needed to call them and give them, I'm like, do not call them. What are you clicking? Don't click the link, dad. But it happens. And it's something you have to talk about. And I hope that the more that we talk about it, we can take the shame away from it to allow people to get help and to talk openly about this, to demystify it. Because especially as people get older, they don't want to turn to their kids. You know, now you've got parents that don't want to turn to their kids and be like, this is happening and I don't know what to do because they don't want to get yelled at. And they don't want to be embarrassed. It's just like kids not wanting to tell their parents shit they did. If we could just normalize being compassionate to people when they tell us the shit that happened and being instead of being like, I can't believe you fell for that. Maybe it would cut these people off at the phone call because they'd be like, mm, this sounds like some scammy scam shit. Click. Let's. Get rid of the shame about being taken advantage of and victimized for shit that's not your fault. Let's do that. Let's do that. Just like we can take away the shame of when you are physically assaulted, it's not your fault. When you are assaulted, it's not your fault. When you are scammed, it's not your fault. Are there things you can do to prevent this? Yes, that doesn't fucking help if you're already in it. Shame allows 
predators to continue to victimize people. So let's just say, fuck you, shame. We're not going to be ashamed and we're going to talk about it. So let's just keep talking about it. Hannah's like, welcome to my TED Talk part two. Catherine says this happens with MLMs. It does, because once you get in, that sunk cost fallacy comes in and you're like, I've already spent this much. I can't get out now. Everyone's going to yell at me if I get out now. Everyone's going to say, see, I told you so if I get out now. Everyone's going to say, oh my God, but you spent so much money. Aren't you so embarrassed? No, don't be embarrassed. Okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm off of my soapbox. But this is a difficult thing to talk about, and it's something we have to talk about, not just with our kids who get scammed in different ways, with like, oh, if you sign up to this website, you'll get all these coins in this game. No, you won't. But it happens to our parents and our friends, too. And we have to talk to them about financial security, too. And it happens as times get harder And financially, I am not a financial expert, but it looks like times financially will be getting harder in times to come. When financial security goes down, these types of schemes go up. And that is a very hard thing because people are more vulnerable. And when they are more vulnerable, there's more opportunity for scams. The beginning of the pandemic was scammy scam central. And it's going to happen again. It is coming Wait, Bethany's like a lot of fraud with online dating for older folks too. Wait, what? We're going to have to get to that. But we have to finish talking about fraud. So the FBI, by the way, will never freeze your computer remotely. They will kick down your door, say FBI, and come grab it. Thank you, Law & Lumber. I feel very validated. Victims get embarrassed. And then they stop. Like the embarrassment and the shame can paralyze people. If you've ever been paralyzed by shame, raise your hand. And this isn't just with scams. This happens with medical care too. When you're ashamed to tell your doctor something's going on, this happens with so many things. Shame is not something we need. It's not helpful for us. Okay. Okay. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. There's more information in this, and some of this is based on what Jen Shaw said in her plea. In approximately 2017, Shaw began operating a Manhattan-based sales floor that sold downstream business opportunity products to victims on lead lists provided by the defendant as part of the business opportunity scheme. Between 2018 and 2020, Shaw controlled the day-to-day operations of the Manhattan sales floor. How? Among other things, Shaw with other participants moved certain operations for the Manhattan sales floor to Kosovo to avoid law enforcement and regulatory scrutiny. The salespeople on the Manhattan sales floor engaged in the, scheme, in the same fraudulent sales practices as other telemarketing floors in the BizOp scheme, namely lying and misleading their victims into purchasing business opportunities, products, and ostensibly advance their non-existent online business. Shaw undertook significant efforts to conceal her role in the BizOp scheme. For example, Shaw, among other things, incorporated her business entities using third-party names, instructed others to do the same, used and directed others to use encrypted messaging telegram applications to communicate with participants and made numerous cash withdrawals structured to avoid currency transaction reporting requirements. That's the money laundering charges that have been dismissed. Shaw of Park City, Utah pled guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud in connection with the telemarketing scheme. Um, Carries a max of 30. She will forfeit 6.5 pay restitution of 9.5. The maximum potential sentence in this case is prescribed by Congress and is for informational purposes only. She'll be sentenced on November 28th. Jen Shaw's statement to people, not people like people, but actually people, magazine people, is as follows. Now that we've heard from the government, let's hear from Shaw herself, well, Shaw's attorney, written by my friend Dave Quinn. Hi, Dave Quinn. 
Um, let's see. She's had Meredith Marks and Heather Gay by her side who have been very supportive of their friend during a difficult time. The source tells people, which is a turnabout for all of you that watch Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. Did anyone have Meredith Marks being at Jen Shaw's side in the hours or the days leading up to her guilty plea? Because after last season where she's like, who's calling who a fraud? I'm like, how did this happen? That's probably on season three. How did this happen? How did this happen? She's had Meredith and Heather by her side who have been very supportive of their friend during this difficult time. And again, people deserve friends. Obviously, her legal troubles have not been easy for Jen, let alone making the decision to plead guilty. This is a hard decision. Of course, this case is a very big part of Jen's story. Of course it is. Jen Shaw is still filming Real Housewives of Salt Lake City after guilty plea. It's a very big part of her story. She's going to federal prison. Of course, it's a, it's the central part of her story. Shaw became a full-time cast member on Real Housewives of Salt Lake City in November 2020 after, after others in this scheme that she had worked with had been arrested. After that. It's some chutzpah. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. She and assistant Stuart Smith were arrested in March 2021 for allegedly. Tar- no, they've both pled guilty now. You don't have to say allegedly. They've both pled guilty. She and Stuart Smith were arrested in March 2021 for targeting individuals with a massive fraud telemarketing fraud operation. They were charged with one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. No. Yes. And one count of conspiracy to commit money laundering. Both Shaw and Smith originally pled not guilty. He eventually pled later that year. Smith has not been sentenced. She maintained her innocence until Monday, where she appeared in a New York court and pled guilty. The reality star admitted to committing wire fraud offering services with little to no value. She said that in court. We used interstate telephones and emails. I knew many of the purchasers were over the age of 55, she continued, per a Twitter thread from Inner City Press's Matthew Russell Lee. Did great reporting on this, and we'll go look at that in just a second. I'm so sorry. Shaw's guilty plea means she will not stand trial. Her attorney, Priya, said, Ms. Shaw is a good woman who crossed a line. She accepts full responsibility for her actions and deeply apologizes to all who have been harmed. She, without impunity, declared her innocence over and over and over again on the show and, and said and said um, that everyone would be proved wrong. Very similar to Erica Jane. Ms. Shaw is also sorry for disappointing her husband, children, family, and friends and supporters, the lawyer continued. Jen pled guilty because she wants to pay her debt to society and put this ordeal behind her and her family. And as she affirmed by signing the other document, because she is in fact guilty. Let's look at the wonderful reporting from Inner City Press over on Twitter. Uh, Let's go see. I had it pulled up and then I closed that tab because WAP. (laughs) Because we are professionals here. I want to know how they knew this was coming into court because this popped into the docket quick. And they were there. They were on it. So curious. All right. Let's make this bigger. So we can see it. Okay, Jen Shaw here in courtroom 23A for a change of plea. Inner City Press has been covering the case even before Shaw was added to it. We'll live tweet a thread below. Um, all rise. The Judge Stein, Ms. Shaw, do you wish to plead guilty to count one? Jen Shaw, yes, Your Honor. Judge Stein, I will need to ask you certain questions. Judge Stein, if there were a trial, you could see and hear all the witnesses against you and your attorney could cross-examine them. Do you understand these rights? This is her waiver of rights. Yes, Your Honor. You'll be giving up these rights. Do you understand? Did you read the indictment? Yes. You're charged with conspiracy to commit wire fraud in connection with telemarketing. Do you understand? Yes. Uh, The AUSA set forth the elements. They do. Do you understand the maximum is 30 years? Yes, Your Honor. Note, um, to get a plea to count one, the U.S. is dropping count two. Yes. You understand you'll lose valuable civil rights, including the right to vote and bear arms. I do. After I receive your pre-sentencing report, I will determine guidelines, which in any event do not bind me. 
Do you understand that the system of parole has been abolished except for good time credit at the facility where you are located? Yes. I have before me a document sent to you by your lawyers. Did you read and sign it? Yes. That's the one we just went over. In this agreement, we've agreed not to appeal the sent. If I sentence you to 168 months prison or fewer, yes. You've agreed to forfeit 6.5 million restitution of 9.5 million. Yes, your honor. Ms. Shaw, what did you do? Ms. Shaw, what did you do? Wire fraud. Offering services with little to no value. We used interstate telephones and emails. I knew many of the purchasers were over the age of 55. I'm so sorry. What is the reason they bought? Shaw. Misrepresentations regarding the value of the product or service of which it had little to none. Judge, did you know it was wrong and illegal? Shaw, yes, your honor. Judge Stein, AUSA, what proof does the government have? We were made aware of the FTC investigations. I say in tomorrow's podcast, these are going to be critical. <laughs> it's like I know things. We were made aware of the FTC investigations against sales floors the defendant worked with between 2017 and 2021. Beyond being a lead broker, she had a Manhattan-based sales floor. She oversaw it. She did not put her name on the bank accounts associated with the business. She only got paid in cash through company credit card and New York City apartments. She li- um, she only got paid in cash through a company credit card and a New York City apartment she lived in. She used encrypted applications, moved operations offshore to Kosovo, and incorporated in Wyoming. The judge, what are the biz offs? So-called coaching services. Judge Stein, Ms. Shaw, how do you now plead? Jen Shaw, guilty. Are you pleading because you are guilty? Yes. I'm signing the consent order to forfeit a sum of 6.5 million. I find your guilty plea knowing. I accept your guilty plea and I judge you guilty. Sensing will be out October 12th. Then there was issues with the date. And then they finished with um, continue to abide by your conditions of release. Sensing will be November 28th and we are done. Thank you, Cindy Ellis, for tagging me. Appreciate it. Um, and then Inner City Press also listed, they put up the, uh, that's not what I meant to do. Ah, they put up the document that we went over here on their uh, document, on their uh, document cloud. Words are hard. So with that, um, if you want to follow Inner City Press over there on the Twitters, a lot of you already do, I'm sure. So, we're going to see all this shit play out on Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. What do you think the ladies are going to see? You're going to see Whitney saying, I said it in the Sprinter van. You're going to see, you know, baby gorgeous up on her cell phone calling 17 lawyers. Oh my God, am I okay? She pled guilty. Am I okay? Can we talk about this phone case for a minute? No, I don't have a case to I add today, but it, I, lo- I love it so much. Anyway, it's going to be a mess. So I'm here's where I'm torn, and then we're moving on to Johnny Depp stuff. Here's where I'm torn. I want to watch. I want to know what happens. I want to know what all the other women have to say. I want to see this go down. I want to see her in the hours after this decision. I want to know how she made this decision. I want to know everything. But I also don't want to support this shit. I don't want to support Bravo keeping people on the show that have harmed so many. Like, I am morally torn about this. But also, here's where I here's where I come down. Um, if she's getting paid to be on the show, then she can pay restitution, and the restitution goes to the victims. And that's in my brain, kind of how I justify it. I don't like it though. And what's interesting is. And we'll have this conversation in a chitty chat stream. When will we have time to do that? Thursday. We're going to have time to chitty chitty chat chat on Thursday. Let me tell you why. Thursday's our members only live stream. So if you are a member here on YouTube's or a member over at Law Nerds Unite on the, uh, on the Patreon where the members only podcast lives, then you will have access to Thursday's live stream. And this is what we're going to talk about a little bit with all the housewives fans, because I need to know your thoughts. I have thoughts. This might be my next I have thoughts podcast. There will probably be multiple of them this month. 
Jen Shaw <clears throat> is guilty of doing the things. There are victims. There are elderly victims. There is a substantial amount of money. Her husband has not faced nearly the criticism that Erica Girardi did. And Erica Girardi is, again, the wife who benefited from Tom Girardi hurting victims. It's interesting. We're going to, we're going to get into that. So if you are members here um, on the YouTubes or over at Law Nerds Unite, where you also get the podcast, you can do that for $3 a month. We will be, we will be exploring this with y'all because y'all are so smart. And I want to know your thoughts. I, we need, we as a group need to have a chat. Can new members still sign up? Yes, always. Always. Always new members can still sign up. If I'm sharing it, it's because you can still sign up. It's just wild. Um, it's just so wild. So I don't know where I stand with Bravo. I'm, I'm torn. I'm torn. The amount of victims is in the hundreds. I imagine that amongst all these schemes, the amount of victims are in the thousands because there are three rounds of prosecutions with over 10 defendants each. So I imagine it's more. Question, do we know how much money they've never said the total loss, but we're looking upwards of 20 million based on the restitution amounts. So, all right. Let's see. Let us, let us, I saw one more question I'm going to answer and then we're going to go. Do you watch all of the Housewives or just this one? Kimberly, I watch most of them. And it depends on time. I am well behind. I watch most of the franchises. So, all right. Let us move on. I'm, 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 I'm real sassy about this next topic. So let's just, I'm just, spicy alert. Warning, warning. Emily feels some kind of a way. What the fuck, Elaine? What the fuck? This motion with regard to juror 15, and I am just covering the juror stuff today. There's other stuff in the motion to set aside the verdict. But now we have the rest of the facts plus sass. What the fuck? At the beginning of this motion, I was like, okay, I see the point. And then I'm like, wait a second. Wait a second. You had all this information. And now we know that she had all this information. Let's look at Johnny Depp's motion, shall we? I'm not pleased. I mean, I'm pleased that we have more information, but all of this is such fucking nonsense fuckery. I don't even know what to do with myself. It's, it, this case won't stop. Do we need more lip gloss for this? Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, we do. We do. Mm. Yep, we're going, we're going with our fave. We, we, we. J Emily, Emily's, Emily's agitated. All right. Let's crack fucking on into this. And I'm not agitated by this response. I'm agitated by this motion. We have more facts and I'm like, oh God, this isn't, this is the song that never ends. It just goes on and on and then. Plaintiff's memoranda in opposition to defendants post-trial motions that are dumb. Wait, that's not what it says. <laughs> oh, Kim. Oh, Kim. We're okay. A sidebar, sidebar. I've granted a sidebar for two seconds. Not only does it have a light, it has a mirror. The link is down in my bio for Gerard Cosmetics uh, with code Lawnard. It has a mirror so that when it lights up, like if you're out to dinner, you can see your lips in the little mirror and put your lip gloss on. Gerard Cosmetics is a woman owned business. Um, anyone who uses a lip gloss a lot knows how brilliant this is. This is made by someone who loves lip gloss and knows that especially as we get older and like to go out to a good restaurant where they turn the lights down, you need to gloss but you need to be able to see. All right, that was my sidebar. Let's continue. By the time we need more gloss, we're just like, 
Mm-hmm. Oh, I also need to know. Damn it. Damn it. I also need to note. There are two lawsuits going on with regard to who's paying Amber Heard's legal fees. I'm just doing it as a podcast episode. We're so behind. We have so much Britney stuff to talk about. I'm going to do it as a podcast. So I'm going to cover the insurance lawsuits going on with Amber Heard. I just haven't had a chance to do it yet. We're happen. We're it's happening. Just not this fucking moment. All right, let's go through the table of contents and see what we're in for. The damages awarded by the jury were supposed. Oh, we're addressing all of it. How long is this? 40 pages. Of course it is. I only went to the jury part. This addresses the entire motion. We're going to go over the jury stuff. And then if we have time, we'll go over the rest of it because I do have a hard stop today. The damages awarded by the jury were supported by the evidence and the law. The verdicts on the complaint and counterclaim are consistent. Agreed. The First Amendment does not bar recovery for defamation by implication, even when the statements at issue involve public figures or matters of public concern. The jury's finding of defamation regarding the op-ed headline was consistent with and supported by the law and facts. Agreed. The jury's finding of actual malice is well supported on the record. Agreed. Mr. Depp presented sufficient evidence to support a finding of defamation by innuendo. The court should not conduct an investigation of juror 15 because the defendant has waived such arguments and has failed to provide any evidence of unfair prejudice or any due process violation. We're starting. We're starting there. We're starting on page 26. So let us, let us hippity hop on down to page 26. Um, or thereabouts, we're going to start with the juror and then we'll work backwards because I know there's other stuff in here that we want to talk about and I'm sure it's great, but we're starting with the juror, uh, 23, 24, 25. All right. 26. The court could, the court should not conduct an investigation of juror 15 because defendants waive such arguments because they knew Alicia asked in the chat, is Amber Heard being sued? Yes. By insurance. Miss Heard's desperate. The T starts immediately. Miss Heard's desperate after the fact demand for attention. I mean, an investigation of juror 15 based on a purported error in his birth date motion at 40 is misplaced. This motion is unknown to the law. As a threshold matter, as a threshold matter, Ms. Heard waived her right to challenge the accuracy of the information listed in the jury panel by failing to raise this objection contemporaneously. Yeah, bring it up at the time. Bring it up at the time. Case law. It shall be sufficient that a party at the time of the ruling or order of the court is made or sought makes known to the court the action which he desires the court to take or his objections to the action of the court and his grounds. Therefore, yeah, you have to raise it. Use it or lose it, friends. Further, Virginia Code 8.01-352, we're good friends with it now, outlines the procedure for objecting to irregularities in the jury list and alleged legal disabilities of jurors provided that. And we went over this. Unless objection to such a regularity or disability is made pursuant to subsection A herein, and unless it appears that the irregularity was intentional or that the irregular irregularity or disability be such as to probably cause injustice mm-hmm, in a civil case, to the party making the objection, then such irregularity or disability shall not be cause for summoning a new panel or juror or for setting aside a verdict or granting a new trial. You can't do that. As discussed further below, Ms. Heard has shown no evidence of prejudice or um, injunctive, and therefore her belated argument Belated argument regarding juror 15 should be rejected by the court. Sure. 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 Refusing to reverse the case where two convicted felons sat on the jury, a matter which was not discovered until after the trial. Defendant made no showing of injustice. Here's the thing. 
they got to do voir dire. They got to ask the questions. And if they get to ask the questions, where is the lack of due process? You had process. You had the list. You had the juror in front of you to ask. And as I said last time I covered this, Your Honor, can we approach? Okay. Your Honor, can we approach? Your Honor, it appears that juror number 15 was born in 1945. Could the court inquire about the birth date or the skincare routine because juror 15 appears to not be 77 years old? Thanks. That's it. That's all. And then they cite other case law where much more wild things happened and it was not grounds to overturn. We've talked about those with regard to the Maxwell case. I've said that this was probably a nothing burger, but I did say at the beginning, the investigation, it'd be interesting to find out how this happened. But then we got more information from Elaine and it was clear how it happened that they seem to have the same name or at least same last name and live at the same address and be of the same gender. And that's how that happened. It's so wild to me to see, it's so wild to me to see people who purport to be lawyers, not of people I know on the Twitters, not the, not the YouTube lawyers on the Twitters saying things like, oh, this seems well taken. No, it fucking doesn't. No, no, it doesn't. It never seemed well taken at best. It was interesting and a curiosity as to how it happened, but she got to question the juror. There's no violation of due process. This was always a nothing burger and a curiosity. All bun, no burger. Contrary to Ms. Hurd's contention otherwise, the parties do have a statutory obligation to verify the parties. Elaine, you have a statutory obligation to verify the accuracy of the information listed in the jury panel before trial and any errors are not grounds for mistrial. Any error in the information shown on such copy of the jury panel shall not be grounds for a mistrial or assignable as error on appeal and the parties in the case shall be responsible for verifying the accuracy of such information, which means questioning the juror. Disregarding this clear statutory language directly on point, disregarding the law, disregarding this clear statutory language directly on point to Ms. Hurd's issue with juror 15, Ms. Hurd shamelessly presents this argument to the court. They did actually, I have issue. I like, I agree, but also they put it on, they put it on a footnote And then they said, but that's not the issue here. The issue is not that the information on the jury list was wrong. The information was that the wrong juror showed up. It's different. They split hairs more finely than is acknowledged in this motion. Disregarding this clear statutory language, Ms. Hurd's issue with juror 15, Ms. Hurd shamelessly presents this argument to the court. Further, the clerk's office provided the pre-panel jury list to the parties on April 6th, five days before the jury was impaneled. I have so many thoughts, which gave Ms. Hurd ample time to verify the accuracy of the information contained therein. In a rare moment of candor, ooh, 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 in a rare moment of candor, Ms. Hurd admits that she was aware of this purported discrepancy in Juror 15's birth year from the very start of trial because, quote, Juror 15 was clearly born later than 1945. Oh, so it was vis- visibly apparent. Here's the thing. Amber Heard said on the stand, even though she wasn't supposed to, that she spent over $6 million defending this case. If you are spending that kind of money on this case, there is no fucking way they don't have a jury consultant or at least Steve Barlow who is doing ops on the jurors. Someone is doing jury research on a case she's suing for a hundred million. She's being sued for 50 million. And it's likely that the losing party in this case gets yeeted out of Hollywood. Do not tell me that you didn't have a fucking jury consultant looking at this list and investigating these jurors. And if you had a jury consultant looking at these lists and investigating these jurors, then you fucking knew when juror 15 sat down that they weren't in their seventies. 
and then you said nothing. That's on you, Elaine. So I wasn't at sanction these people before this response. It's not like they got the list as they sat down, which so happens often in criminal law. You get a list, you sit down, you can't really do research anyway. It's like, whatever, ask them questions and hope that they're that person, it's fine. That five days in advance. And if that's five court days, there's also probably a weekend in there somewhere. So really actually probably seven days. And with seven days, there is no way that a jury consultant didn't look for every single one of these people. So you knew, you knew, you knew. And your jury consultant knew. And you didn't say shit. And the judge should say, what the fuck? No, this strains credulity and propriety at this point. Five days. Five days. You knew. And that's where my mind has shifted on the issue of sanctions. Because you had this information five days in advance. It's clear that the juror was not in their 70s. Then this motion is not being brought in good faith. Ms. Hurd admits that she was aware of this purported discrepancy from the very start of trial. Good. Bring it up then. Ms. Hurd chose not to raise this alleged, quote, discrepancy with the court during the voir dire process or at any time during the six-week trial and thereby waived it. Agreed. Moreover, Ms. Hurd's argument is based on pure speculation. Wouldn't be the first time. First, Ms. Hurd cites publicly available information that Juror 15 was actually born in 1970 but fails to attach such information to her motion or otherwise identify it for the court. Hmm. Oh, there's a footnote. <clears throat> la la la. Let's get to a footnote. On the afternoon of July 8th, 2022, a full week after the deadline to file post-trial motions. Ooh. What's my say? Ms. Hurd filed a supplemental memorandum in support of Section 7 of the defendant Amber Hurd's post-trial motions based on additional discovered facts. As addressed in Mr. Depp's concurrently filed motion to strike, Ms. Hurd's supplemental memorandum is untimely. When was the motion to strike filed? Where's the motion to strike? Your Honor, can you please start putting these back up so they're publicly available? Where's the motion to strike? Someone, anyone, if you know where the motion to strike is, email me. As addressed in Mr. Depp's concurrently filed motion to strike, Ms. Hurd's supplemental memoranda is untimely and should not be considered by the court to the extent I rock the mic like a vandal, light up the stage and watch me jump like a candle. Damn it. They're the ones that start sentences with to the extent all the time. The only lawyers that do. And every single time I'm triggered, I can't help it. My brain short circuits. To the extent the court does consider this additional information, i.e., with all due respect, you shouldn't. If it's on Twitter, send it to me. Just DM it to me. All right, I'll find it. I'll find the motion to strike. Oh, the motion to strike is on the website in Fairfax. Good. I've been traveling. I'll find it. Ah, good. We'll get it. I'll pull it up. We're going to have to do another stream this week. I'll figure it out. All right. Thanks, everybody. Perfect. In Mr. Depp, I haven't looked at the website since the end of last week. Where was I? I got distracted by the motion to strike. Okay, to the extent, no, no, short circuit. If the court does consider this additional information, which it shouldn't because it's late. To the extent, damn it, Mr. Depp maintains his contention that Ms. Heard has waived her argument. I agree, has waived her argument with respect to Juror 15, has based her argument on pure speculation, and has provided no evidence that she was prejudiced in any way. Mm -hmm. How are you impacted? Has provided no evidence that she was prejudiced in any way or that her due process was somehow violated. Correct. But it's interesting. It's made fetch happen and given us something more to talk about. You know, the pro herd folks have been awfully mad about people covering this case. 
if they just stop doing things, I promise you we will all move the fuck on. I so desperately would like to move on. There are so many filings I'm behind on for Brittany, in Girardi, in Murda. There is so much happening. So stop it. Stop it now. Stop. If you want everyone to stop talking about it, stop doing stupid shit and we will stop talking about it. I promise you. Or I promise you for me. I can't promise you everyone will stop talking about it. Some people will still say stupid shit. But I would like to move on. But we cannot. Stupid shit keeps happening. Second, Ms. Heard provides no support whatsoever for her conclusory assertion that her due process was somehow compromised. She was like, meh. While Ms. Heard has a right to an impartial jury, footnote 11, she has failed to identify any way in which the inclusion and service of juror 15, assuming arguendo, there had been a mistake in his birth year, somehow robbed her of this inner opportunity. You asked questions. Footnote 11. See Beavers versus Commonwealth. The purpose of the selection procedure is to select a fair and impartial jury. Mm -hmm. You got to select them. The purpose of voir dire, voir dire, brain stopped. The purpose of voir dire examination is to ascertain whether any juror has an interest in the case or any bias or prejudice related to it. You got to ask questions. You're done now. You're done now. She has failed to identify any way in which the inclusion of the service was a problem. Unsurprisingly, Ms. Heard cites to no case law because there isn't any to support her argument that the service of juror 15, if he is not the same individual that the court assigned as juror number 15, somehow compromised her due process and would warrant the drastic remedy of setting aside the verdict and ordering a new trial. That's never happening on this. Ms. Heard makes no showing of any prejudice and accordingly her speculative arguments fail. Neither the sole fact of irregularity nor the mere suspicion of injustice based on the irregularity is sufficient to warrant setting aside a verdict. <clears throat> Even assuming arguendo, we love an arguendo, Miss Heard's latest thesis, i.e., that a son served instead of his father, there would be no prejudice, as juror 15 was qualified to serve as juror in Fairfax County and was vetted during voir dire. You asked questions. Tough shit. It's too late now. The shit's literally out of the horse. Such speculative arguments unfounded in law, unknown to the law, and without factual basis are improper at the post-trial motion stage. At this point, after a six-week trial is held, the court should exercise its discretion and yeet Ms. Heard's argument and sanction them. That's not what it says. The court should exercise its discretion and reject Ms. Heard's belated speculative and clearly pretextual arguments regarding Juror 15. Yeet. Yeet. I cannot get away from the thought that they held on to this. And that would be so improper that my brain doesn't even want to go there. But I've seen so much lawyer fuckery in the time I've started covering pop culture that I shouldn't be surprised by things anymore. But I feel like they didn't say anything so that they could try to bring it up later. And that is hideous. All right, we've got time. Um, I want to get to some questions, but I want to get to some of the rest of this motion. So let me zoom, zoom up to the top of this, and I'm going to try to go through their, highlight their arguments um, on the other points because we went through the entire motion from heard, and we have not gotten into this. We're going to have to add an extra live stream this week or some shit because we are so busy. <clears throat> Booked and busy. Okay, whoever scanned this, I appreciate you, but this is hurting my head. And if I don't get to Super Chats, I'm sorry. I see them. I appreciate you. I might not get to all of them. Living Sweetly said, if the insurance, insurance companies have paid the legal fees, then isn't EB lying to the court jury by stating that Amber Heard couldn't bear the donations because of the lawsuit? No. And can EB be disbarred for it? No. Um, but no, she isn't lying to the jury and the court saying she couldn't bear the donations because of the lawsuit. Amber Heard lied when she said that. Amber Heard said she couldn't donate because of the lawsuit. And Camille Vasquez pointed out very clearly, you had that for 13 months before you were sued. Is anything going to happen from that? She lost the case. 
I want to name a puppy what if anything and call it Elaine just so I can hear your voice in my head. <laughs> Elaine! Motion to suspend chat rule regarding all caps so that we can yell at Elaine for two minutes, please. Law and lumber. Nightbot will yeet you. We've got a bot set up. The bot knows no bounds. The bot is unforgiving. The bot helps my brain. But Nightbot will still get sassy. But this is dumb. Um, Kathy said, want to send you an alpaca numbered bracelet from Millions Alpacas. Would you like one to wear what I send it? My address, my mailing address is in the description of all of my stuff. And of course, of course, I'm happy for anything you guys want to send me. I love how creative the lawnards are. Jacqueline said, I'm a law nerd. I love how you break everything down for us. Loved your coverage of Debt V. Heard. Here for Jen Shaw. I'm here for it. We've got so much more to cover. Living Sweetly, the claim that Juror 15 is an imposter is ridiculous. Unless this was a game of Among Us, and then it would be amazing. They had the info prior to the proceedings and didn't bring any concerns. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. When are you getting your own Gerard Cosmetics gloss shade? Jen and I have been talking about that. Thank you for the kind words, Big Kahuna. All right, let's get into the rest of this motion a little bit before I have to stop. I've got a, I've got, today is a day of back-to-back -back interviews after, after traveling a lot and not sleeping very much at all. Tomorrow I'm going to collapse and you will not see me on the internet. Following a six-week trial and jury of Ms. Hurd's peers, following a six-week jury trial, a jury of Ms. Hurd's peers rendered a ver Miss Hurd does not see them as peers. There's no way. There's no way Miss Hurd sees them as peers. She sees them as those people. Those people. Those jury people. There's no way she sees anyone as her peers. Definitely not us. We are definitely not peers. Very much above us. Very much. Us lawners all be here together. We are peers. <sighs> Though understandably displeased with the outcome of the trial, Ms. Hurd has identified no legitimate basis to set aside in any respect the jury's decision. Virginia law is clear that a verdict is not to be set aside unless it's plainly wrong or without evidence to support it. Here, the verdict is well, was well supported by the overwhelming evidence, consistent with the law and should not be set aside. Mr. Depp respectfully submits this motion to the court that he sh the court should yeet Ms. Hurd's post-trial motions, which verge into frivolous. Your Honor, these motions are bullshit. Yeet. The damages awarded by the jury were supported by the evidence and the law. There were a lot of facts. The court should reject Ms. Hurd's baseless contention that the damages award was excessive and unsupported by the evidence. Under Virginia law, the court may only correct a verdict that is so excessive as to shock the conscious. We took a poll here when we read that. Y'all weren't shocked. While Ms. Hurd slings an exceptional amount of mud at the wall in hopes that something might stick. Why did we go with mud and not spaghetti? I have questions. Why mud and not spaghetti? Oh, we are randos, chat. We're totally randos. We're legal randos. Yep. All the randos. Mm-hmm incredibly average randos. Um, why the mud slinging analogy? I kind of like it, but it feels like it mixes two because I'm thinking spaghetti wall, not mud wall, but whatever. Miss Hurd slings an exceptional amount of mud at the wall and hope that something might stick. The jury verdict on damages was perfectly reasonable and supported by the evidence and testimony in this case. For instance, Mr. Depp's manager, Jack Wiggum, testified to the following. And then they go through the testimony about the pictures, the compensation for the pictures. We watched it. We saw it. Wait, there's a footnote. Where's the footnote from? Find the footnote. I don't see. Ah, there it is. Mr. Depp did not appear in any studio films between December 18, 2018, the date of the op-ed, and October 2020, the date before the UK judgment. Footnote one. <clears throat> I'm going to just leave that there. <laughs> I'm going to leave that chat there because, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She might have been flinging amica cream at the wall. That's a very fair point, too. <laughs> oh, you guys are the best. All right. Miss Hurd's assertion that Mr. Depp, quote, made no attempt to limit his damages to the time period preceding the UK judgment is simply false. <laughs> 
The testimony elicited from Mr. Wiggum and Mr. Depp's damages experts were all limited to the period between the publication of the op-ed and the date of the UK judgment. Moreover, the jury instructions expressly limit the time period for which Mr. Depp could recover damages, stating both that, quote, Mr. Depp cannot recover damages for any harm that occurred after November 2, 2020, and that any damages must have been caused by the defamatory statements at issue. Oh, those pesky jury instructions. Juries are presumed to follow the instructions, says Davidson versus Commonwealth. And there's no reason to believe the jury did not follow the instructions in this case. Those pesky jury instructions. Hmm. I love that they lay out the evidence again. They say this testimony on its own fully supports the $10 million verdict, as a reasonable jury could infer from this testimony that in the 22-month period after the op-ed, Depp lost one or more studio films as a result of the op-ed and the newly alleged sexual violence allegations. Mr. Wingham also testified that he had negotiated and agreed upon a deal for Mr. Depp to star in the sixth installment of the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise for $22.5 million that as of the fall of 2018 before the op-ed, the producer of the film Jerry Bruckheimer really wanted Mr. Depp in that film, and that in the immediate aftermath of the op-ed being published, it became clear that Disney was going in a different direction. Michael Spindler, an expert in forensic accounting, testified that Mr. Depp lost earnings of approximately $40.3 million between December 18th and November 2nd. As a result of the op-ed, $20 million in lost income from Pirate 6 and $20 million in lost income from other potential projects, reaching his conclusion or reaching this conclusion with respect to the lost income um, was in that $40 million range. And they go through that. Oh, there's another footnote. Well, we're not going to skip the footnotes. Oh, this is about Disney going in another direction. Hmm. I totally agree with this. Hey, okay. Make friends with Nightbot. Oh, there are 26,000 randos in the chat, y'all. And there's over a thousand of y'all over on Facebook. Go ahead and do the likey, subscribey, YouTubey things here. We're all, we're over 660,000. We're just shooting for 666 to because it's funny. All right, let's go. Footnote three. One must heard selectively cites the testimony of Disney's corporate representative stating that she did not know whether Mr. Depp would appear in a sixth installment of Pirates. As discussed above, it is the jury's job to weigh the credibility of each witness when there is conflicting testimony, make a determination as to which testimony is more believable. Disney, of course, has great incentive in not Disney, of course, has great incentive not to state anything controversial or otherwise damage any potential future relationship with Mr. Depp or any other actor. Moreover, Tina Newman, the individual designated to testify on behalf of Disney, clearly acknowledged that she was not informed on the matter and that others at the studio might have been more knowledgeable but were never deposed. That decision doesn't fall within my job responsibilities. It's above my head. Best way to say it. There are people that I work under, and those particular persons may or may not have more knowledge, but I cannot speak on behalf of them. Given Ms. Newman's own acknowledgement that she lacked information and could not speak on behalf of her superiors, her evidence borders on useless, and the jury was entitled to disregard it or give it little weight. The jury could reasonably believe that the testimony of Mr. Wingham and others who testified regarding Depp's damages, moreover, Ms. Hurd's insinuation that Mr. Depp may have lost Pirate 6 due to the UK judgment is completely unsupported by any evidence. Moving on. In addition to the evidence cited above and significant actual damages, Mr. Depp is also entitled to presumed damages because Ms. Hurd's statements were defamatory per say. This court has repeatedly confirmed that misheard statements were defamatory per se, and jury instructions were given on that basis. Accordingly, Mr. Depp was not even required to present proof of actual damages to sustain a verdict. We talked about that a lot because defamation per se, it didn't come up a lot, but we talked, we brought it up a lot. Um, They cite case law regarding that, talking about uh, defamation per se, while Ms. Hurd cites four Virginia cases in support of her remitter argument, each defamation case must be assessed on the specific facts of the case, and the cases cited by Ms. Hurd are clearly distinguishable. They are not the same. Then they go through more case law. Um, they go through why Hurd's case law is not, not on point. They talk about the Sheckler case. Those are different. 
Ms. Hurd argues here that the $10 million in compensatory damages awarded was intended to punish her, but that clearly is not the case. The $5 million in punitive damages was intended to punish her. Ooh, we love the sass. We love the sass. No, no, the $10 million wasn't punishment. You've misread. The $5 million was the punishment. The $10 million was for the damage that you caused. They say that Ms. Hurd asserts that damages to Mr. Depp's career must have had other causes other than the op-ed, but as noted, there was ample evidence introduced that the op-ed harmed Mr. Depp in unique and multiple ways. Ms. Hurd attempts to argue that the fact that evidence was presented about the party's historical relationship and Ms. Hurd's initial allegations of abuse in 2016 somehow suggest to the jury award uh, somehow suggests that the jury award damages for conduct by Ms. Hurd separate from the op-ed dating back to 2016. Not so. It was obviously necessary to present evidence regarding the historical relationship and allegation since that provided necessary context for the jury to evaluate the defamatory nature of the statements. If she hadn't said two years ago, I don't think they could have gotten into it. Um, but that's how they evaluate the defamatory nature of the statements in Ms. Hurd's op-ed. She rung that bell. And her purpose, motives, and veracity in continuing to claim to have been abused in the op-ed. But at no point did Mr. Depp request damages for anything other than the statements in the op-ed. The jury instructions were explicit. That damages were required to be caused by the defamatory statements at issue. And Ms. Hurd's arguments are based on nothing more than pure speculation. Footnote 5. Furthermore. Ms. Hurd waived any objection to the contents of Mr. Depp's opening and closing statements, as well as questions posed and testimony regarding historical events by failing to timely object. You've got to bring it up then. Use it or lose it, Elaine. You know this. There is nothing about the jury's award that shocks the conscience and Ms. Hurd's argument that the verdict is obsessive and unsupported by the evidence should be emphatically yeeted by the court. That's not what they say. Oh, I almost dribbled coffee. Okay, the verdicts on the complaint and counterclaim are consistent. I'm curious if their thought process is similar to my thought process. I haven't read this part yet. I went to the jury stuff first yesterday, and then I went to bed when I got off a plane. Because the Wi-Fi on my flight sucked. I have to deal with that later today. I'm annoyed. The verdicts on the complaint and counterclaim are consistent. Ms. Hurd's argument that the jury's verdicts are inconsistent is clearly wrong. While the jury, while jury verdicts that are irreconcilable, that's a hard word for me to pronounce, inconsistent, irreconcilably inconsistent cannot stand, the court will harmonize jury verdicts. Sorry, my chair is pissing me off. Ugh. The court will harmonize jury verdicts alleged to be inconsistent if there is any way to do so. Here, there is no inconsistency between the jury's verdict on the complaint and counterclaim. The jury returned a verdict in Mr. Depp's favor on all three statements in the complaint. Each of those statements contained a defamatory implication that Mr. Depp abused Ms. Hurd. We know the three statements. The jury's verdict on those three statements in the complaint reflects the jury's determination that Mr. Depp did not, in fact, abuse Ms. Hurd and that Ms. Hurd was lying about being a victim of abuse at the hands of Mr. Depp. As to the three statements in Ms. Hurd's counterclaim, the jury determined Ms. Hurd did not meet the elements of defamation for the two statements by Mr. Waldman stating Ms. Hurd's abuse allegations were a hoax. Again, this verdict reflects the jury's determination that Mr. Depp did not, in fact, abuse Ms. Hurd, i.e., it was not defamatory for Waldman to state that Hurd's abuse allegations were a hoax. That's perfectly consistent with the jury's verdict on the three complaint statements. The third statement in, Mr. in Ms. Hurd's counterclaim is the sole statement for which the jury found Depp defamed Hurd. Quite simply, this was an ambush, a hoax. They set Mr. Depp up by calling the cops. This is the spilled a little wine one. As is clear from even a cursory review of Waldman's words, there are multiple highly specific and detailed factual elements to this statement that the jury could determine were false while it still concluded that the abuse allegations by Ms. Hurd about Mr. Depp were false and defamatory. That's what I said. For example, the jury could have determined that Ms. Hurd lied about being abused, but that she and her friends did not spill a little wine and rough the place up in an attempt to make a false police report. Right, because they never made a police report. 
They refuse to make a police report. It makes sense. Of course, such a finding on this sole counterclaim statement is not inconsistent at all, much less irreconcilable blah, 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 with the jury's verdict on the other five statements. Agreed. The First Amendment does not bar recovery for defamation by implication, even when the statements at issue involve public figures or matters of public concern. <gasps> This court has repeatedly held that Ms. Heard's statements in the op-ed are sufficient to support a claim of defamation by implication, and Ms. Heard presents no arguments in her motion that would justify a reversal of those rulings at this stage. Agreed. Agreed. Indeed, Ms. Heard egregiously and flagrantly misrepresents Virginia law in arguing that the Virginia Supreme Court has signaled defamation by implication may not be applicable when it involves a public figure or matters of public concern. The Virginia Supreme Court has made no such suggestion, and the out-of-context language relied on by Ms. Heard is misleading. Oh, shit, the court's not going to like that. If the court views this the same way that it's viewed by Ben Chu, the court's not going to be happy with that at all. The court's going to be like, no, no. Don't misrepresent what the Supreme Court said. That's not that's not uh, helpful to your case. While there is something to be said for arguing and for looking at how to argue and contextualizing things to work for you, taking things completely out of context to change their meaning isn't what is intended by advocacy. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes. It's interesting. In Pendleton versus Newsom, the Virginia Supreme Court reiterated Virginia precedent that defamation can be made by inference, implication, or insinuation. In that case, the defendants argued their statements were protected by the First Amendment. The Supreme Court rejected the argument stating a defamatory innuendo is no more protected by the First Amendment than is defamatory speech expressed by any other means. They then uh, discussed another case. But in Chapin, uh, Chapin, the court recognized in such a case that libel by implication, that a libel by implication plaintiff must make an especially rigorous showing that the expressed facts are literally true. The language must not only be reasonably read to impart a false innuendo, but it must also affirmatively suggest that the author also intends or endorses the inference. The Supreme Court in Pendleton went on to distinguish the specific language from the facts in Pendleton stating, quote, our decision in defamation cases does not include a requirement that libel by implication, that a libel by implication plaintiff must make an especially rigorous showing. The plaintiff's burden of proof by a preponderance of the evidence, the plaintiff's burden of proof is by a preponderance of the evidence, nor have we held that the defendant's words must by themselves suggest that the author intends or endorses the alleged defamatory inference. Such a holding would immunize one who intentionally defames another by careful choice of words to ensure that they state no falsehoods if read out of context. Hmm. To the contrary, the Pendleton court recognized explicitly that because defamatory speech falls outside the protection of the First Amendment, a First Amendment analysis is an apposite in a case in which the plaintiff must allege and ultimately prove that the defendant intended his words to express defamatory innuendo and that the words actually did so and that the plaintiff was actually defamed. Indeed, many other jurisdictions have recognized the sound policy that defamation by implication is permissible for public figures. Right. Because at some point people are like, well, if I straight say it, it's defamatory. But if I imply that you murdered someone, then then it's not defamatory, right? No, it's defamatory. You can't imply reputationally damaging shit that is not true. Which, this case is a good case study for anyone who does content or commentary to look very carefully at defamation by implication because I think there's a misunderstanding that, well, I didn't exactly say that. It doesn't, if you implied it, it can still be defamation. Uh, let's see. As the testimony and evidence of the ACLU's corporate representative in this case showed, I think that was some of the most damaging evidence in this case. I think the ACLU evidence was truly the most damaging evidence to Amber Heard other than Amber Heard's own testimony. 
the a- when I saw the ACLU testify, I was like, well, fucking hell then. Um, as the testimony and evidence of the ACLU's corporate representative in this case showed, Ms. Hurd made a very calculated effort in crafting the language of the op-ed to try to avoid any explicit defamatory reference to Mr. Depp while clearly referencing him implicitly. She should not be able to skirt liability stemming from the devastating impact of her op-ed by carefully choosing her words so as to convey a defamatory meaning about Mr. Depp without actually using his name. The media can't understand that. The amount of articles I've seen saying the op-ed in which she didn't even name him and what? And what? The op-ed where she didn't even name him. So you don't have to. Such a result would be manifestly unjust and has no support in Virginia law. Footnote six. To the, damn it. Every single time. To the extent I rock the mic like a vandal. <laughs> Light up the stage and watch me jump like a candle dance. <laughs> this is the only law firm that starts things with to the extent. Other law firms use other language that also triggers my brain. But this one, we're just never getting away from Ice Ice Baby with this. Ice Ice Baby. Boom, boom. That's right. This is what it is. Cursy nursey. Ben Chu's like, if you got a problem, yo, I'll solve it. That's what it is. Ben Chu's got ice ice baby in his head as he's writing this. He's like, if you got a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Check out the, check out the hook and let my DJ revolve it. Ice, ice. Emily, you've got a hard stop today. You have interviews. You have to keep moving. I can't. Miss Heard invokes the non-binding law of other jurisdictions where defamation by implication of a public figure is only permissible when the inference arises from the omission of material facts in the challenged communication. Such a standard would still be unavailing for Miss Heard, who failed to disclose the material fact that she was not sexually or physically abused. They took that opportunity to say that. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. We need a video of Ben Chu doing the Ice Ice Baby dance, though. Yes, we do. Camille is the hype man. Yo, 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 yo. (sighs) Andrea, Amber Heard, I want to move on, literally doesn't move on. Some of these motions needed to be made. It's just part of doing your job as a lawyer. Some of it needed to be made. The Juror 15 stuff didn't need to be said. You could have not said that. It could have just, especially on all the facts here, it could have just not been said. Um, The target of such defamatory innuendo as a public figure does not change the calculus, and then they go on why that argument should be yeeted. The jury's finding of defamation regarding the op-ed headline was consistent and supported by law and facts. I agree. There was definitely enough evidence here. Um, I really do want to get to some questions. But I want to talk about malice. This is going to come up more as we talk about the insurance lawsuits because while you might have insurance that covers you from things including defamation, they're not going to cover willful torts. And this tort is willful. Beth, I haven't seen them ask for sanctions. I think I think Elaine will be admonished, but I haven't seen them ask for sanctions. This courts are very hesitant to sanction. They're not hesitant to threaten it. They are hesitant to actually do it. The jury's finding of actual malice is well supported in the record. I want to see what they say because I know what I'm saying. I know what I think points to malice. Ms. Hurd's argument that there is insufficient evidence of actual malice is specious. I don't use specious enough in my life. Like a lot of the words I would use to argue things in court have gone and been replaced with things like yeet and shit. I feel like my vocabulary was a bit broader when I was arguing things to the court and I couldn't say things like shit. I feel like I found other ways around it. Um, Yes, Karen, it does make Amber Heard a tort feaser. Amber Heard is in fact a tort feaser. I need, I need to start weaving in some of my old lawyerly language again. In the context of defamation, actual malice requires proof or knowledge or reckless disregard as to the falsity of the statements at issue. Of course, actual malice may be proven by circumstantial evidence, since rarely, if ever, will a defendant openly admit knowledge of falsity, unless you're looking at the Cardi B. Tasha K case. And then that happened. And then that happened.
There was copious evidence presented at trial from which the jury could find and did find that Ms. Hurd's false statements about Mr. Depp were made with actual malice. Indeed, the jury concluded that Ms. Hurd lied about being abused, the falsity of which is necessarily within her own personal knowledge. They did not argue that she did not know or was unable to recognize that these things didn't happen. I wonder if they had leaned in to the histrionic personality disorder diagnosis and said, look, this is true. But everything she said, she believes to be true. They didn't go that route. They went with this happened. If they had gone the, it's not a lie. She believes everything. Even if you don't believe her, she believes her. She, she told her therapist, she told her friends, she told everyone this was going on because she believed it. Then you might not get to the state of mind, but that's not the case they tried or argued. Thank you, Jordan. Well stated. So, indeed, the jury concluded that Ms. Hurd lied about being abused, the falsity of which is necessarily within her own personal knowledge. Ms. Hurd necessarily knows whether Mr. Depp actually engaged in the abusive conduct she alleged. And if he did not, which the jury found to be the case, then she necessarily knows that too. By way of example, Ms. Hurd obviously knows firsthand whether Mr. Mr. Depp struck her on the face with a cell phone on May 21st, 2016, a few days before she walked into court with a mark on her face to obtain a domestic violence restraining order and publicly proclaim, pro, publicly proclaim herself for the first time to have been abused by Mr. Depp, which claim she subsequently renewed in her op-ed. Such facts are inescapable within her personal knowledge. If, as the jury concluded, her allegations of abuse were false, then the test for malice is satisfied by ber- virtue of the jury's finding that she made those allegations up. Simply put, a reasonable jury, having found that Ms. Hurd's story was false, could reasonably conclude from evidence that Ms. Hurd was aware that her claims were false. How do you know she made that shit up? Well, we don't believe that shit happened. Therefore, she made that shit up. That's what he's saying. Uh, And then they're going into case law that supports that. They said, indeed, there's compelling and substantial evidence that was presented at trial that Ms. Hurd's story of abuse was deliberately fabricated. This is the issue that Hurd's team is running into. Now that the trial is over, the jury has decided. They're bringing up there was no malice, and it allows these lawyers to go in with much stronger language than pretrial because the jury supports them and call Amber Hurd a fucking liar. And they are going to do that in every response they have. Every single time her team opens the door, they're going to bring a fucking wrecking ball to take out the entire wall of, but the jury said she's a liar, but the jury said she's a liar, but the jury said she's a liar. And they are doing it to themselves. They have own gold this case so often, it's unbelievable. And at this point, I have to wonder if her attorneys are advising her that if she keeps opening these doors and these motions, it's going to get worse. Or maybe they're confident because the media doesn't seem to pick up and run with it that that it doesn't matter. Maybe they think, well, people aren't going to report on how much Ben Chu is pointing out that Amber Heard lied. Maybe they're just confident that the media is still on their side running with a narrative that this is all some kind of orgy of misogyny or some shit. Like, is the media emboldening some of these motions? Because what's the downside for them, really? No, Miley Cyrus is not riding this wrecking ball. Ben Chu is. Ben Chu is riding. I picture Ben Chu riding the wrecking ball and, and Camille Vasquez operating the controls. Or maybe Jessica Myers operating the controls. Ben Chu, though, is the one on the wrecking ball in a suit with candy spilling out of his pockets and a stuffed llama. Can you see it? I can see it. Candy trailing out of his suit pocket, a stuffed llama and one hand on the wrecking ball. I see it in my brain. I see it in my brain. Um, Barry Houdini says, I don't see your PO box in the description. I'll make sure that we add it. I'll go look. Yes, the tie blowing in the wind. Yes, 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 yes. In a suit, in a suit with candy spilling out of the pockets. With a stuffed llama holding onto the wrecking ball. 
<laughs> Creative law nerds make it happen. Tag me in it. <laughs> oh, indeed, there is compelling and substantial evidence that was presented at this trial that Miss Heard's story of abuse was deliberately fabricated. Merely by way of example, they're like, oh, there's so much shit, but let's just pick one. Mr. Depp clearly testified to ha never having abused Miss Heard either on May 21st, 2016, or any other occasion. CEG, and then they pull the transcript. It's insane to hear heinous accusations of violence, sexual violence that she's attributed to me, that she's accused me of. All false. I have never in my life committed sexual battery, physical abuse, all these outlandish, outrageous stories of me committing these things. Furthermore, Mr. Depp's testimony that he did not abuse and in fact was abused by Ms. Heard was corroborated by multiple other witnesses. These witnesses included without limitation... Without limitation, the eyewitness testimony of Mr. Depp's bodyguard, Travis McGivern, who testified to never seeing Mr. Depp strike Ms. Heard, but that he did see Ms. Heard strike Mr. Depp. Similarly, Mr. Depp's bodyguard, Malcolm Connolly, testified that he never saw any injuries on Ms. Heard or witnessed any violence by Mr. Depp, but that he did witness injuries on Mr. Depp, as well as witness Ms. Heard throwing items at Mr. Depp. Moreover, there was evidence presented at trial that the photographs that Ms. Heard took of her purported injuries had been edited. Yes, there was. There was multiple versions of the same photographs and that their authenticity could not be confirmed, from which a jury could reasonably infer that Ms. Heard had manipulated them. And there was evidence from which the jury could infer that Ms. Heard's initial public allegations of abuse were, from the onset, part of a deliberate campaign against Mr. Depp in the context of the party's divorce. For instance, testimony was presented from a former employee of the tabloid TMZ. Oh, hello, Morgan Knight. Rando number one or number two? No, Morgan Tremaine. Darn it. There's too many Morgans. I think they're both delightful. I'm going to interchange their last names. This is Morgan Tremaine. For instance, testimony was presented from a former employee of the tabloid TMZ that the paparazzi had been notified in advance by a reliable source that Miss Heard would be seeking a restraining order, would have the alleged bruise on her face, and could be photographed, and that could be photographed at a particular time outside the courthouse. Ms. Hurd's arguments that the element of malice has somehow not been established are utterly meritless, misleading, and amount to nothing more than bullshit. I'm sorry, and amount to nothing more than an improper request for the court to substitute its judgment for that of the jury. Ms. Hurd cites to out-of-context snippets of exhibits, which she contends support her claim of abuse, but the fact of the matter is that the jury weighed the evidence from both sides and concluded that Ms. Hurd's claims of physical abuse, which she renewed in her op-ed, were a lie. This is a determination properly made by the jury. It has evidentiary support on the record, and it cannot be set aside now merely because Ms. Heard disagrees with it. Someone go tell the internet or the small corner of the internet that just because Ms. Heard disagrees doesn't mean it's true. Someone said, I'm ashamed I know the difference between the Morgans. Don't be. Spicy Draco's great. It's Spicy Draco versus versus Hicksville Trailer Park. In my brain, I can determine the difference, but it, my mouth doesn't always cooperate. Truly. Oh. Mr. Depp presented sufficient evidence to support a finding of defamation by innuendo. We've kind of gone over that, and I agree. Um, it's going to be a lot of what they talked about earlier. There's sufficient evidence, including the op-ed itself, that would reasonably cause a reader to understand the headline to be about Mr. Depp. It's misplaced to attempt to escape the jury's find uh, well-founded findings. Ms. Heard's first attempts to discredit the op-ed and have the headline Amber Heard, I spoke up about sexual violence and face our culture's wrath, read in isolation. Ms. Heard argues that because there was no evidence that she had accused Mr. Depp of sexual violence prior to the publication of the op-ed, the circumstances surrounding the publication could not have reasonably caused readers to believe the headline referred to him. As is recognized by the very authority Ms. Heard relies upon in evaluating the defamatory meaning of a statement, it's appropriate to consider the context. Yep. The headline thus is appropriately read in conjunction not just with the surrounding circumstances, but also with other statements in the op-ed, including the other two statements the jury found to be defamatory. Like the headline, which references experiencing our culture's wrath, one of those statements also states that Ms. Heard experienced our culture's wrath two years ago when she became a public figure representing domestic abuse. The headline thus could also be understood by readers to be referring to speaking up about sexual violence two years ago. 
Mr. Depp presented evidence of relevant surrounding circumstances that would reasonably cause a reader to understand the three statements about him. I think we're all on the same page there. And I am going to go to questions real quick as we get into this and the, the juror 15 stuff we got. DA said the mods in this chat are incredible. The mods in this chat are incredible. Um, the mods uphold the don't be a dick rules in our chat. It's like, we're welcome if you're welcoming, but we don't name call. We don't do this. We don't do that. And that's fine. Um, <laughs> see goody. If the mods don't think you're joking, you might get yeeted <laughs> because, um, we all know that that's not true, but you know, I'm just, I'm just mindful. The mods yeet trolls. That is, that is one of their primary primary things. Emily, will you be covering the Taylor Swift trial? If it's the one about the song lyrics, I've been meaning to get back to it. And we haven't had time to do copyright shit. I've been wanting to do copyright shit. We haven't had time to do copyright shit. We have been so busy. Okay. I have questions. You have questions. We're going to try to speed run some questions and some super chats. We're not going to get to all of them because I do have to take a break, um, before my next situation. All right. I have questions. You have questions. We have questions. Please read the motion to strike by Ben Chu. It's snarky in its own right. I will. I think we're going to have to do a separate stream because we need to do Britney stuff this week too. And we have a, we have a, um, members only stream on Thursday. So I'm going to have to look at my calendar and figure out because Friday I can't do five hours. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Emily, I'm currently working on the Ben Wrecking Ball masterpiece and it's low-key <laughs> nightmare fuel. We love nightmare fuel. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. But yes, the mods protect the chat from trolls and those that want to come in and be a dick. So we don't do that here. We don't name call here. Here's my thoughts on it, truly, as I get to questions. There is so much room on the internet for being a dick. It's kind of what the internet is for. The internet has so much of speaking your mind, having your opinions, talking your shit, biting your lip. Like the internet has all of it, but our chat has civility. Our chat has conversation with compassion because that's the community I've created in my little square of the internet. So if you want to go name call people, that's fine. Go to Twitter, but we don't do that here. And it's because we want to have conversations without name calling, without ad hominem attacks, without disparaging, because there's plenty of factual shit to talk about. Elaine, what the fuck are you doing? Doesn't need name calling to come in. It needs a real question. What the fuck are you doing with this? What are you doing with this? Like, what if any thoughts were in your fucking brain when you filed this motion? Because no. Cause no, totally. Jersey said you need to do a monthly stream with Ho, Grunkle, and Rob. If they're down for it, I'm down for it. It was really fun. We love civility with cursey words. We can curse about shit. Look, I have no problem calling out actions. What is this motion? Why are you arguing the law this way? This is disingenuous at best, and that's a kind statement about some of these arguments. But that doesn't need to devolve to name calling. So anyway, let's go. Ah, oh, somebody just said kudos here. Kudos to everyone who manages not to be a dick, even in the face of Amber Heard's prolonged provocation. Thank you, Fat Weasel. We try. We try. And it's why I don't wild out on people on the internet either. Sometimes in my brain, I'm like, woo, now's the time to read a bitch. And then I take a deep breath and don't. Sometimes in my head I do. But there's, there, I, there's no need. Very rarely will I respond to something and I tend not to respond to negativity. I just don't. I would rather engage with the law nerds. If I spent my time fighting with people on the internet, I don't have as much time to talk to y'all. I just don't have the energy to fight with people on the internet because some people really just like to fight. And they're like, this fuels my need for attention. I'm not fueling your need for attention if you just want to fight on the internet. Someone else will give you the attention you so desire. If you want to create a platform around name calling and nastiness, that's fine. And few do, but okay, that's not where I'm at. 
Laura said, since the Johnny Depp trials started, the Pirates of the Caribbean ride has been shut down for a remodel. I go to Disney every week and no one says why it's shut down. I want to know if they're taking Jack Sparrow out of the ride. Anybody? Laura, I can't imagine that they would. I will ask my, I have some very deeply connected Disney friends. I will ask. I can't imagine that they would. They've made a lot of changes to that ride. It really might just be that they needed to, to fix it. So it really might be. Um, Sister Babylon, question, thoughts on RR calling and recording Tom Girardi and shopping the recording around legal gross. Will you cover it? I don't cover fuckery. And I just talked about not name calling people on the internet and I can't address this at this point um, without that. So I do not like surreptitious recordings. I will not be covering it. I, I will not be covering it. If you are doing copyright, please collab with Leonard French at Lawful Masses YouTube. He's the master of copyright cases. I will go look for sure. We're going to do some music industry stuff. Question, what do you think of the possibility of the Kardashians having Britney's 600 million? What? Susie, I haven't even heard that. If the Kardashians have Britney's money, give it back to Britney. As Runkled might say, if you want to make a particularly barbed comment at Elaine, you can call her my most learned friend. Exactly. There are ways to convey that my learned friend does not understand the law at hand. I tried to give Elaine grace. Runkle encouraged me to be even more gracious. And that is gone. Now we've gotten to just what the fuck. Emily, as you and the boys were saying on the live last week, you're friends with other attorneys. Do you think Team Depp is friends with Team Heard? No. No, I don't think so. They might have respect for some. I could see them getting along with Rottenborn more than Elaine. They might have some mutual respect, but no, I don't think they are friends friends. I don't. Um, I hope they are able to work together collegially, and they seemed to work together collegially, but do I think they're friendly friends? No, I don't. Uh, they also work in different locations. I think Team Depp is all, I think those lawyers on Team Depp all get along really well. And sometimes you don't even see that within legal teams. Like there was tension on Team Herd. You could feel it. I don't know what it was about. But Dr. B, I hear you. But I don't know why. Um, Living Sweetly said, this is the shit storm that keeps on giving. Why can't the court reprimand, reprimand? They can. They can. About the unacceptability of the conduct before the court. They can. And what is the threshold for court to take action? The court could admonish it. But we've seen stuff that's farther afield. And the court's like, I'm not sanctioning this. The court can say, this was a waste of the court's time. I'm still laughing at your Ben Chu wrecking ball visual. I so needed that deep laugh. Thank you so much, Emily. Sometimes we do just need to laugh. Laughter truly is the best medicine. Um, I need a new tattoo. Now I want Ben Chu on the wrecking ball. Zoe, sleep on that for a little bit. <laughs> my only suggestion on tattoos, sleep on them for a little bit. Oh my God, you guys, yesterday, I, yesterday, okay. Just, I have just a few minutes. And I'm going to try to get to Super Chats. But yesterday, I got to JFK Airport early enough to go to Sky Club and have food. I had not eaten enough. I had been out of pocket all day. I was literally sitting in a chair doing recording and stuff from like 10 something in the morning to like 4.45, almost 5. From the time I got to the airport to the time I boarded my plane, I walked over five miles because that is the fuckery that popped off. Through all the airport wanderings, I ended up having a terminal change, which in a massive airport is always like a, <gasps> really? So I get on the van or the the transport thing to the shuttle to change terminals. And I get in and I'm talking to Brian as, as I'm hanging up, somebody else gets in who works with a production company who's got glorious purple hair. And he's like, what up purple hair friend? And I'm like, what up purple hair friend? He has Star Wars tattoos across his knuckles. I'm like, also Star Wars friends. And he's like, also Star Wars friends. So we became best friends in the five minute shuttle ride. It I had such a nice laugh just chatting with my fellow purple haired Star Wars tattooed friend. It was so delightful. I love those little moments. I love the little moments of just like, 
Emily, the motion to strike is only three pages. It might be easier to cover today. Sky is the neighborhood, the things we could have done. <laughs> the extreme light up saga, whack, wait, to the extreme, light up a stage, wax a chump like a candle. Did I get the lyrics wrong? I might have. I do that. <laughs> Held back on purpose to mistrial, and that is an improper purpose, and it should be yeeted for that. Translation from law speak, Judge A, with this answer, you can tell Amber Heard to shut it and fork off. True. But she's trying. <laughs> Elaine is like, I'm trying, Your Honor. I'm trying. To enlighten you, U.S. citizens who use French words in your law, voir is to see and dire is to say. I know what it means. I just pronounce it badly. Can J.D. get more money from Amber Heard if she keeps making him incur legal fees? No. Not at this point. Not on anything that's happened. The fake juror was just Kate Moss and a mustache. Amazing. <laughs> the Kate Moss could be mistaken for a 77-year-old man. That's another visual. Every time there's a new filing, I imagine Elaine saying, I'm trying. I'm trying, Your Honor. Elaine, Elaine, Elaine got her litigation skill handed to her during this trial. I don't think there's a complete separate motion on juror 15. It's this motion that incorporates it. 10 million is excessive. Didn't Amber Heard ask for 100 million? Yes. Finally caught a live stream. Hello from Poland. I'm currently moving and your streams are the only thing keeping me sane. I'm so glad. Tomorrow I'm undergoing a closet. A per I did the bougiest thing and I have no regrets. If you guys want me to cover this chat, let me know because I've got to, I've got to bounce in like three minutes. We hired professional closet organizers to help me organize my closet so I can pack more easily because it's been, since we moved, it's been super stressful and I'm so excited. So if you want me to show that process a little bit, I will be doing that over on Instagram at the Emily D Baker. You guys, the home edit is coming to my house. I'm going to die. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. So I will be covering it on, it is, Lewis, it's the bougiest shit ever. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. All right. I will, if you guys don't follow me on Instagram, I'll be doing it over on Instagram. It is, Tasha. It is the home edit. Look, they're a local woman-owned business. I never knew that was an occupation. Oh, it's the coolest shit ever. I can't wait for that. I need the help so much. I just need it. I need it because packing causes me so much anxiety I was like, how can I limit my own anxiety? And this is one of the ways I'm going to limit my anxiety because I am traveling so much. Um, I need things to move more quickly. So I hope that they're going to help organize the closet in a way that I can pack more quickly. My um, Insta is at the Emily D Baker. So um, I was hoped it was them since you were both in Tennessee. Yes. Packing makes me so stressed. But I hope that if it's easier to all my stuff is in one place that I can just do it. So I've always done this stuff myself and I just can't make my new closet work in my brain. So I need someone else's brain. I need someone else's brain. I do have a lot of things that are ready. Um, but I'm just so excited. So yes, if you guys don't follow me on Insta, I'm at the Emily D Baker. Same with the Twitters. I'm at the Emily D Baker. Best way to end my workday is with your stream. Well, thank you, Bethan. I appreciate that. New coffee table book opportunity for Diana Jenkins. Sell 23 <laughs> and include mugshots of past and present housewives. There's so many mugshots. This is brilliant. Somebody else should do it. There are so many mugshots between like DUI arrests and everything. There's a lot of arrests for housewives. Does it show what they are recommending time-wise? It, sh no, that... For Jen Shaw, that will be in the sentencing memos. So, bet you didn't think you've got a Saudi super fan. Well, thank you, Jude Ka. I'm happy to see it, but I do see the podcast trending in Saudi Arabia sometimes, and I'm like, oh, go for it. Um, you get what you get, and you don't get upset. That's where we're at with this. Um, there better be a very extra special place in hell for targeting the elderly, elderly and vulnerable. I can't imagine that there's not, and it's without your Gucci bag. What is fetch? George, the chat will let you know what fetch is right now. Would it be inappropriate to send the lady judge a beaded collar with a note that I admire her? R.R. Smith, 
Um, no, just know that it will be um, it will be looked at by court staff, send it to the courthouse, the court staff vets that kind of stuff. But no, there was I was part of a secret lawyer lady group. And one in the secret lawyer lady group sent a stunning collared necklace to Ruth Bader Ginsburg before she passed. And RBG sent her back a note with um her thanks and encouragement and then wore the said gift in the supreme court photo that year it judges do not often get told that they are appreciated normally everyone just fucking hates them and lets them know that so it is very um it is very much acceptable just send it to the courthouse and know that it will be vetted before it gets to the judge. Question, how do you feel about the Kat Von D case? Seems like it could be a problem for the tattoo industry. We're going to go through it. It's on my list when we get into that copyright cases. How many years did Jen co-conspirators get? I break that all down in the podcast tomorrow, which I've got to film an addendum for. Every time you say Elaine, I look up like, what did I do? YouTube user, it's not you. <laughs> she EB is ruining my nerves at this point. Look. There's times people refer to me as EB because I'm Emily Baker. And then they refer to Elaine Bredehoff as EB because she's Elaine Bredehoff. And then I get confused. I'm like, oh, what did I do? Do they mean EB? No, I'm EDB. She's ECB, which is funny because it's like the Eastern Columbia building. Her initials are the ECB because she's Elaine Charleston Bredehoff. But I'm like, you have to just call me EDB because if you call me EB, I'm going to think it's Elaine. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. You guys, I'm sorry. I really, really, truly do have to go. Ultimately, AH and EB's contentious attempts to undermine the court and jury reflects their own lack of character, not the courts. Question, has Elaine acted unethically here? It's real disingenuous and it's really pushing the line of what zealous advocacy means for me. Lawyers do a lot of stuff that I personally do not like, but when it's in court, when it's zealous advocacy in court, the court gives a lot of leeway of zealously advocating for your client. Outside of court, there is not as much leeway. Oh, yes, and also Eve Barlow, all the EBs. So just stick with EDB for me. <laughs> with that, you guys, thank you for being a law nerd. Thank you for being here. There's a new podcast going up in the morning. I will be back on Friday for sure. I'm going to try to have an extra stream this week, but we do have the members only live stream on Thursday. I believe it's in the morning this week. Let me just check. We, or this month, we shift between 11 a.m. and 7 to accommodate law nerds in all of our different time zones. So let me see. On Thursday, members only live streams at 11 a.m. Maybe an extra evening stream on Thursday and on Friday so we can get to everything and get to questions, get to some of the super chats that we missed. Um, the advice Runkle gave you about giving Elaine grace reminds me of people saying relax, but all you can do is anything but that. But it was, it was, it was, I didn't feel like Runkle was ever like, oh, you need to relax. It was like, she has a difficult client. Let's give compassion and grace. And it was a reminder to me that that is one of my values. Um, and that's deserved in an up to a point where it's no longer deserved. Fun fact, my younger sister's babysitter's house, my younger sister's babysitter's house was used in Vanilla Ice's movie. We have a Polaroid of him in front of his purple bus with a hot dog in his mouth signing her shoe. That's incredible. Calzone, I love everything about that statement. I love everything about that. Thank you all so much for your support. Thank you for being here. I'll see you around the interwebs. I have got to go. I'm recording some podcasts today. I will let you know when those are out around the interwebs. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Okay, I got to go. Bye. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.